Before we get too deep into all of this, I will say that there are no spoilers in this video in regards to who wins each season. I say this because I will be talking about 40 plus seasons of Survivor, but I will be mainly showing footage from only the premiere of each season to avoid any spoilers. So you can feel safe in knowing that each season will be briefly discussed with nothing ruined for new viewers. However, there is one exception as I will have to cover season 40, which is all winners, but I will label a spoiler warning before we get there. With that survivor is now clocking in over 42 seasons and counting and with that comes a lot of history and debate over which part of its history was truly the peak which times were the worst and all of the in-between so today I am not only going to define which seasons fall into which eras of survivor but I will be ranking them all as well and will tell you which season of each era is my personal favorite this video was made possible by the patrons on my patreon and they picked this topic to be covered consider joining them to get videos early and to pick what videos I make. Let's go back, way back to the first era of Survivor, which I will be calling old school. Now, many fans have interpreted old school in many ways, but for the purposes of this video, I am labeling seasons one through eight as the original old school era. Survivor began in season one as a simple premise, put 16 strangers on an island and forced them to vote each other out every three days for 39 days until only two remain and the winner is decided by those who have been voted out. It's a game of pure social politics and it was completely revolutionary revolutionary at the time for television. As minimal supplies were given and the players truly are surviving on an island, there is no script, it is not fake. This is real. It was presented in a documentary style, which we will see shift over time, and the phenomenon only grew with season two, the Australian Outback. Here we have almost a one for one recreation of season one, but with a few changes. Mainly the new setting being in Australia and not on an island. The change of 39 days to 42, which is actually gonna slow the season down, and it's the only season that will have 42 days. But the biggest change in gameplay comes from the fact that these people had watched season one, whereas season and one players that had no idea what was going to happen. They had never seen this before. They were making it up as they went. Season two had a basis of how this game is played. And because of that, they also knew that America was watching and judging them. A lot of actions were decided by how these people will be seen after the show is over. And it even decides who ultimately wins this game. Season three, Africa is in a dubious spot as it was filmed before 9-11 happened, but it didn't air until right after it. It is the same basic game as the last two seasons. Social politics is still ruling all here, but the introduction of a tribe swap in the pre-merge is the first ever unannounced twist that the players had to account for, and the conditions of this season can easily be labeled as the worst of all time. We then move on to season four Mark Cases, which unlike Africa, had its production completely flipped on its head because of 9-11. So instead of filming in the country of Jordan, where Survivor production had done months and months of prep work on, they had to throw together a season at the last second in the South Pacific. This season took a large step forward into showing what was possible with the social politics aspect of Survivor by having the majority alliance get completely 180'd in the post-merge game, something that had never been seen before or even thought possible. And then of course is the infamous final four purple rock draw that would shake up the game and have players change their strategies for years to come and they will bring it up time and time again as being scared of a rock draw happening to them. Another one does happen, but it doesn't happen for another 23 seasons. Season five, Thailand, while having the most hated cast of this era, and for good reason, contained almost no changes to the game, aside from a schoolyard pick for tribes in the premiere, a mutiny that was toyed with in the pre-merge, but nobody actually took advantage of, and a fake merge that just delayed it by two episodes, but ultimately tanks the season as a result. Survivor the Amazon is season six, and with it came the biggest shake up to Survivor to date and something that had oft been requested by the fans men versus women which sex was superior at the game of Survivor this change was teased in season 5 but it never actually happened until season 6 and it was a huge shift to social politics and even had one player give us a glimpse as to what was to come in the evolution of Survivor with its social game and making moves season 7 Pearl Islands is commonly referred to as the best season of this era by far despite having some of the biggest twists associated with it thankfully they all worked out and that's something important to remember because from here on out, 
they won't all work out. But here, they do. And none of them blow up in the show's face, which it very well could have. Some of these twists include the controversial outcast twist that blindsided the players and the audience with everyone who had been voted out so far being given a chance to get back in the game. Two players do just that and are given immunity right out of the gate. And while Survivor had been pure social politics and challenges up to this point to save yourself, the guaranteed immunities was the first time a twist saved players and it is yet another sign of things to come. We also get a kidnapping, a double travel council, and the first ever official quit in the game of Survivor. The seal had been broken in a lot of ways with Pearl Islands. Season 8 caps off the old school era with All Stars, the first ever season to feature players returning to play the game, which includes already knowing each other and having off island things affect gameplay on the island, something that really couldn't be accounted for by the show. There were three tribes, 18 players, and multiple immunity necklaces for the first time ever. The show also tries to push the players to the breaking point by only giving each tribe a pot and a machete, and that's it. It is hardcore as the rain and storms hammer home how hard it was to survive in these earlier seasons when the physical survival part meant so much more to the audiences at home. As I said before, All Stars is truly the cap on the bottle of the old school era. So next we move on to what I call the experimentation era of the show. This is defined as seasons 9 through 14 and this is when Survivor says, screw it, let's start to throw everything we think of against the wall. After all, pretty much everything we have done so far has worked and in this era the twists are more hit and miss but the hits are what makes it not that bad as the cast is still important to the show but this is where the twists start to eat up more and more time with the show but not too much yet so season nine vanuatu brings back the successful men versus women twists of season six but ends up with a totally different result and at this point each season has moved just a little bit further away from the documentary feeling and closer to something akin to a long form movie and this will persist until pretty much the last era i talk about in this video. But here, it hasn't jumped the shark by any means. This season's winner feels like a protagonist of a movie with their storyline. Not too many twists happen this season, namely we see the individual immunity necklace come up for one episode in the pre-merge, and the premiere was unfortunately shortened when it clearly had the content for a longer episode. In my personal opinion, this is the best season of this era. Now season 10, Palau, is a season filled with Survivor First that are all in the baby stages of development. We see our first ever 20 player cast, though two players are voted out on day two before ever officially joining a tribe. Exile Island is thrown together at the last second for one episode. We see two different iterations of the new fire making tiebreaker with the second one being more akin to a modern season and an epic one of a kind event with the blue tribe in the pre-merge. If you know, you know. A lot of things happen this season, but just like with most seasons in this era, these lots of events do not do much to detract from the characters and this is the final season where social politics are 100% the reason someone is voted out. Season 11, Guatemala pulls a new rabbit out of its old hat as we see two returnees, both coming straight from Palau, playing in a cast of all newbies. It sounds unfair, and in some ways it is, but these two returnees are not strategic geniuses, so the game isn't truly messed up like it could be, oh, and it will be in a later season. We do see Survivor do its most extreme challenge in the history of the show by forcing both tribes to hike 24 hours to their camps in the premiere episode, and we also see the first version of the Hidden Immunity Idol, which does affect the Tribal Council it's played at. Season 12, Exile Island takes that one episode idea in Palau and the other idea in Guatemala with the idol and expands them both into one massive season-long twist. Exile Island is a place where one player is, well, exiled to, and the island contains the second version of the Hidden Immunity Idol. This time, it becomes a super idol that you can play after all the votes have been cast and read. It is way overpowered and does really affect the social politics as everyone is scared of the person holding the super idol. And we also see four tribes for the first time ever, and they are all split up based on age and sex. Season 13, Cook Islands does put the focus back on social politics in a lot of ways, but uh, not the way you might hope, as the four tribes this season are divided by race, a decision that survivors mocked for doing for years, and it all ends up working out by the end though but the decision on paper is still super questionable. Other than that, we see our first ever successful mutiny, something that popped up in season five, but amounts it to nothing there. The first ever double elimination where the tribe has to vote out two people at the same tribal council. And of course the first ever final three, which came as a surprise and kind of moves away from the idea that you must eliminate everyone before being judged yourself. This season also has the super idol once again, and it does make an impact. And thankfully it's the last time we see it for quite a while. Season 14, Fiji builds 
than what we saw in the past few seasons, but has a few minor changes and one big one. It contains a 19 player cast, the only season to have an odd number, does a version of have and have nots in the pre-merge that makes one tribe's life so good that it's obvious who's going to win the challenges and introduces the permanent version of the hidden immunity idol where you can only play it after the votes are cast but before they are read making for some great drama and it's the one we still know to this day so the experimentation era tried a lot of new things and the majority of them did work out in their favor but the success rate lessened from what we saw in the old school era. But now we move on to what is widely considered the best set of seasons of Survivor, the Golden Age, aka seasons 15 through 20. Here we see less twists introduced and more modified versions of past twists that perfect the formula. Season 15 China goes back to what made Pearl Islands so great by putting a large focus on the location and culture and only makes one notable change to the game. The hidden immunity idols are hidden in plain sight at each camp. You just gotta know what to look for. Season 16 Micronesia is sort of a mix of the idea of all stars and the idea of Guatemala as half of the season's cast is returnees and the other half are new players that are dubbed as fans. Fans versus favorites, a dream scenario in a lot of ways, and it does play out in a lot of great ways strategically and socially, moments that are still talked about to this day. We see some temporary hidden immunity idols for the first time, meaning that their power is limited to a set number of tribal councils, and the editing really starts to mix things up by having a player find an idol off screen not tell us about it and then play it at tribal, which is a surprise to us. This idea was also toyed with in Guatemala, but is perfected here. Season 17 Gabon comes with an obvious visual upgrade. Just take a look at that glorious widescreen HD. Once again, not much happens in terms of new ideas, but we do see a delayed merge, the worst idea of this season, but the lack of twists actually allows for some of the messiest gameplay and character moments ever combined with the surprise winner and the perfecting of the art of fake idols. Season 18, Token Chains is the best season of this era, in my opinion, but that isn't by much as pretty much every season in this era has a group of people touting it as the best season of Survivor ever. We see the return of the voting someone out immediately idea seen in Palau, but like everything else in this era, it is done better and adds to the social politics of the game that goes long into the season. Exile Island introduces the idea of having a player from each tribe go to it at the same time instead of one player by themselves, which is how it's been happening so far. And this also pans out wonderfully, and we see the first ever perfect game of Survivor played, and we get Coach. Coach is the first player I have ever mentioned in this video because him and someone from the next season is important to note as they are large parts as to what happens in the next era of the show with its casting. Season 19 Samoa has some twists and is a real game changer to the show moving forward. We see some small things get introduced like tribe leaders and an awkward do-it-yourself challenge that never should return but unfortunately will. However, the biggest change this season is the storytelling. Russell Hans, the second player of mentioned this video, almost single-handedly narrates everything and the show is clearly in love with him. The season introduces the idea of re-hiding idols after they have been played, and by the end of this season, the fan base is in a massive debate about what is really required to win the show. Now this debate has happened with a few seasons in the past, but it really says a lot when this is the season that the debate still is ongoing about to this day. However, as mentioned before, the editing is so unbalanced that it is a large part of why that debate even happens, and the way it is presented this season has moved more away from the idea that we are witnessing 16 to 20 players journeys to survive and more towards one player's journey. However, season 20 heroes versus villains is the peak of this era for most of the fan base and for good reason. There are almost no twists, no tribe swaps, and the focus on characters is paramount. The editing can still be a bit goofy, especially coming off the heels of Samoa, but aside from a record five idols existing in this season, the formula that Survivor first started with is largely untouched, and it shines because of this. So kind of like when All Stars ended and Survivor decided to start throwing things at the wall to see what would stick, they do that again following Heroes vs. Villains, but this time, most, if not all of these ideas go wrong. We've officially entered the Dark Ages, and much about what is about to take place is because of what we saw with Coach and Russell Hance. Wacky characters get prioritized and is to the detriment of the social political game. Season 21 Nicaragua is the only season of this batch to try and keep things fairly basic, but every idea it tries backfires. 
fires. The tribes are split up by age, but for some reason, no one is between the ages of 31 and 40, a real oddity, making for one really young and in shape tribe and one old, not as in shape tribe. The challenges go as you might predict and the medallion of power is introduced and quickly discarded as a mistake since it is intended to give a tribe an advantage at the challenge. And it does this, but it ends up making the challenges even more predictable. We also see the first ever double quit in survivor history as two players leave at the same tribal. And this may be peak Jeff being upset with the cast. So much so that one of the players who quits is hidden on the show that you could easily not even know they're there until the episode where they leave. The editing has become quite unbalanced again. But we move on to season 22, Redemption Island, and we see the return of the idea put forth in Guatemala. That is two returnees coming into the game to play with a bunch of newbies being treated as tribe captains in a way. While this did work for the most part in Guatemala, since those returnees were not great strategically, here it is a disaster. And unless you like the returnees, it is hard to watch. Add on to that the twist of Redemption Island where if someone gets voted out, they still have a shot to return to the game via duels and asking yourself, does this undercut the entire idea of Survivor where where you're voted out, your torch gets snuffed and you are done. It sounds like a cool idea on paper, but every cool idea this season kind of gets stomped on. Season 23 South Pacific does the same exact thing as season 22 and every player on season 23 has had the chance to watch 22 in terms of its format and twists, but with one exception, the two returnees are are not strategically great, and it makes for a much more entertaining season as a result. But there is a cult that develops here that does sour the overall experience, in my opinion. Sounds crazy, and it kinda is. But this season stands alone as setting the record for the highest number of times someone is voted out in the same season. Season 24, One World, brings back the concept of men versus women again, but to greatly diminishing results. The last two times it was fun, and it played out in an interesting way. This time, no. The cast is truly a dull batch, and for some reason that one awkward DIY challenge we got in Samoa is brought back but multiple times, and it sucks each and every time they do it. The only positive coming out of this season is the idea of one world where both tribes live on one beach. It brings the only good part of this season, and it ain't saying much, though I wish they would bring it back. Season 25 Philippines is the one and only bright spot in the dark ages. If it wasn't for what followed after this season, then this would be the dawn of a new era. Once again, we see returnees mix in with newbies, but all three of them are former medically evacuated players who were big characters, but not big strategists. Those are really the best kind of returnees for these mixed seasons. And this is the final season to feature no tribe swap. And it's the first to have three idols in play at once. One character of the season will completely change how you think about the show. No doubt about it. Season 26 is the final part of this dark era. We see the return of the fans versus favorites format of season 16, but this time the entire cast is questionable. There might be one or two favorites and hardly any real fans. It's more of a hot mess versus recruits season to me. And the pre-merge gets dark, really dark, like uncomfortable. Thankfully the post-merge is fun, but like almost every season in this era, the lack of a good cast drags it down a lot. The Dark Ages brought a lot of criticism from Survivor fans, and the fact that we just had a golden age of near perfection right before it, just to turn around and have bad casting, twist completely bomb, and a lot of dark moments just sucks. Is this even being made by the same people anymore? Well, thankfully, that all begins to change with the next era of Survivor. Seasons 27 through 32 are the renaissance of Survivor, a return to glory, if you will. And it all begins with a brilliant twist in a brilliant cast, season 27, Blood vs. Water is really what Karamoan should have been. Half returnees and half newbies, oh, but not just any newbies. All of them are related to the returnees in this season in one way or another. While Redemption Island returns with some quality of life improvements, the most important aspect is the drama that unfolds with loved ones seeing their loved ones voted out and on Redemption Island. It makes this season everything it is, and it doesn't even cover the other twists like there being a day zero for the first time ever, voting out two players on day one like in Palau, but they still get a shot to return on Redemption, and the first ever rock draw since season Four. Blood vs. Water has pretty much everything it aims for work in its favor. Next is Season 28, Kagayan. We see the idea that we should split up tribes of newbies based on people in them again, but unlike in Cook Islands where it is race-based, here it is between brains, brawn, and beauty. Basically a positive attribute no matter which group you are in. And this season has a stellar cast and it keeps the twist to a minimum. There is the return of the super idol seen in Season 12 and 13, but it doesn't take the player to the 
Profile 3 anymore like it did in the past, and it adds a lot of fun drama and social political moves, along with this season having the most titles ever since Heroes vs. Villains with 6, but it still doesn't feel like too much. Kai Gaian is by far the best season of this era, and that is really saying a lot. Our next season is San Juan del Sur, aka Season 29, aka Blood vs. Water 2, but this time with all newbie players. While not as fun as the last time Survivor does this, it does provide for some memorable moments, and it brings back Exile Island for the first time since Token Chains, which gives some great drama since it is cross-tribal. Season 30 Worlds Apart takes the idea of Kai Gaian being split up into three newbie tribes by profession instead of attributes. White Collar versus Blue Collar versus No Collar. It is notable for a few things happening, the first being a day one decision for a a couple of members on each tribe to pick between extra beans for their tribe or clue to the hidden immunity idol. It brings good drama right out the gate, but really has us getting to know who these people are right away, which in my opinion is the most important part of the premiere. We also see every single idol this season played effectively, the only season this ever happens, making for some wild tribals. And while this season is the final one to feature an auction as of the time of this video, it brings a lot of memorable moments and completely shifts the season as a result. We also see the introduction of the extra vote advantage the first time we see an advantage for a tribal that is not guaranteed safety. Season 31 Second Chances aka Cambodia is unfortunately the last time we see a location really be a part of the identity of a season of Survivor, but it 100% works. This is the only time we see a cast picked by the fans of the show, and of course they're all returnees who played once and lost and want a second chance to win it all. As a result, we see some surprises here in terms of gameplay and a lot of changes that work out, those being idols hidden at challenges instead of at camp, the first ever split from two tribes to three, the introduction of the vote steal advantage, and one player setting an iconic record for the most votes negated by their idol at tribal council. Only one other player has tied them since. Our last season of this era is season 32, Ko Rong. Once again, we see brains, brawn, and beauty applied to how the tribes are split up, and once again, it works. We see Exile return, but only as a one episode twist, the introduction of the juror removal advantage, which brings a lot of strategic and social drama to the show, and medical evacuations galore. At minimum, five people are on the fringe to be pulled from this game for how harsh the conditions are, and this is why we will see some major changes beginning with next season in terms of location and luxuries. But why Ko Rong is best remembered is for the ending and refueling of the debate seen in Samoa and Heroes vs. Villains about what is really required to win the game and is the winner really the worthy one? The next era is a controversial one that is very much hit or miss for the fan base. It is the era of big moves, and it consists of seasons 33 through 40. You may notice by now that the eras that thrive are the ones that minimize new twists, and if they do introduce new twists, then they mostly work out. I would say less than half of the time they work out in this era, but there are so many that you don't get too much time to dwell on each of them. Gone are the days of a documentary feel. It's not even been around for a while, but here it's especially done for. This era has us creeping closer and closer to straight up game show as the era develops. We start with season 33, Millennials vs Gen X. Survivor is now in Fiji, which is gorgeous, but it will not leave for a minimum of 10 seasons as of the time of this video. Let's cover all the twists thrown in this season before covering why this kicks off the Big Moves era. We see the idea of a pre-merge summit, meaning a meeting between players of different tribes, and it amounts to nothing here, unlike in season 6 where they did it for a tribe swap. But the idea is intriguing enough that it gets expanded upon in season 41. There are also the introductions of reward steals, legacy advantages, and the idea that big moves and resumes are what juries want to look for when voting for a winner. While this isn't true and has been touched upon in the past, here it becomes such a talking point that it is clear that the show wants us to believe it is true, whether it is or not. Which is why Season 34 Game Changers takes this idea to the next level by being all about big moves. The cast are all returnees, and supposedly they were picked for the big moves they made in past seasons, but it can be easily argued that half of this cast does not fit that description at all, which does affect how the season ends up playing out. We see advantages galore here, Exile Island is a ship that features a returnee coming back on it to give advice to others, vote steals hidden at challenges, tribe swaps happening way too soon and too frequently, a joint tribal council that ultimately tanks multiple players' games that we love, and the first ever time a player is eliminated from the game not for receiving votes or for being medically evacuated, but for not having an advantage. 
a moment infamously known as Advantage Geddon, and a turning point for most fans as we get a smack in the face as to what Survivor values more than the people playing the game. Season 35, Heroes vs. Healers vs. Hustlers, takes a cast of newbies and splits them up into three tribes called, well, I already said it. We see some controversial decisions made this season, such as the final four fire making twists being sprung upon us and the players as a surprise. The general sentiment is if we knew about it from the beginning, it would have been okay. It's okay when it's a surprise to the players. Those things have happened for many, many seasons now. Not that it would have made the players make any different decisions leading up to it, but it has spawned many conspiracy theories about production interference. We also see a new record for idols in the season. Previously, it was six as seen in Kageon but here it is nine an insane number that is now large enough for half of the cast to have one for themselves final tribals format also gets shifted from every juror getting their own individual time to talk to the finalists to a group discussion of everyone talking all at the same time all these big changes overshadow a good cast and the introduction of the vote blocker which is a shame season 36 ghost island is the idea of bringing back exile island but now littered with relics and artifacts from past seasons players go to it and play a simple game for a chance to win an advantage that was shown in a past season but was played unsuccessfully. It's a cool idea on paper that never really pans out. The fact that players can go to Ghost Island and choose not to play the game, or can choose to play but then be told there are no advantages to be won, just sucks the air out of the season long twist. Add on a mostly boring cast and the season had nothing else in itself to save the day. We also see a cool idea on the post merge game where everyone is split up into two teams and they vote at tribal separately. The next season is 37 David versus Goliath, by far the best season of this era, and let's cover all the twists they throw at us this time. An idle nullifier. That's it. This season thrives on a great cast who carries the load of this season on their backs and have this being heralded as what the fan base wants from the show. So with that lesson learned, we go to season 38, Edge of Extinction, where the lesson is immediately thrown away as despite there being a great cast, there are so many twists and it turns out to be too much. So much so that the show has to start putting who has what advantage on the bottom of the screen every time they talk. First off is the elephant in the room, the return of Redemption Island on steroids now known as the Edge of Extinction. This is a place where everyone goes to after being voted out and no one is forced to leave unlike Redemption Island. Some problems with this include an edit trying to balance screen time between three tribes and the edge, four returnees who are mixed in here who are all great strategically, except for one who is all physical, and people theorize that this season was made for him. And if you return from the edge, you are handed an item a la the outcast twist in Pearl Islands, and there are now 13 jurors at the end of this season, some of whom never met those sitting at Final Tribal Council. It's a lot. Add in an advantage menu, the introduction of a challenge disadvantage, and all the usual things we have come to expect, and Survivor is too busy stuffing and twists to care about how much time they actually have for the show. Season 39, Island of the Idols ramps it up, but not in a good way. The extra island this season contains two Survivor legends who give tips and tricks to the new players to help them with their own games, except all it does is add in a bunch of advantages like Ghost Island that we cannot keep up with and actually hurts players' games instead of helping. It's fun but it's bad. We also see a new record of idols, whereas season 35 had nine. Here we have, count them, 12. That's right, 12. Many containing various powers and they have become so easy to find that you no longer really need to venture further than the walking path to find them. Just look at that stub next to where you're already walking and bada bing bada boom. It's a mess and that isn't helped by this season containing a player who is a sexual predator that makes it far in the game before being forcibly ejected, but way later than they should have been. And the show not having the opening theme song anymore. What a bummer. But with season 40, we get what the fan base had been asking for for years, a cast of all winners duking it out for the ultimate crown. Here is your spoiler warning. Check the chapter marker on this video and skip to the next era to keep your eyes pure if you don't want to be spoiled on 20 winners, which I do not recommend being spoiled on. Survivor is so much more fun when you don't know, and it's also fun when you do know, but why ruin the first experience of not knowing? Okay, here we go. Winners at War has an amazing cast that is overloaded to the brim with advantages and edit issues. Sound familiar? 
the Edge of Extinction returns, but now with more advantages that can be exchanged with players in the game for a currency called Fire Tokens. It's really cool on paper, but hard to keep up with as a casual fan. It's as if no lessons were learned from Season 38, as we see more and more advantages added in, like a 50-50 coin for immunity, an extremely unfair extortion advantage, and the jury now containing 16 players. That's only one shy of having the entire cast on the jury, a bunch of whom never even made the merge and saw how the players were playing this season. The one positive is the cast does carry this show. All winners deliver and the prize money is increased to $2 million, but only for this season. This pretty much takes us to today and the new era of Survivor. Jeff Probst has said, drop the four when looking at these new seasons as they have gotten rid of labels for each season and just stuck with whatever season number it is. But don't let that drop the four fool you because they reference past seasons constantly. There are still advantages galore and pretending like it's harder than the older seasons when older seasons had bigger disadvantages than the new ones. A shortened schedule and advantages being even easier to find in some situations. It's hard to know when this era will end and how it will develop, but so far it is doubling down on the confusion of the Big Moves era to its own detriment. Okay, so let's rank all of the eras. You have heard me talk about each season, so I will spare you the explanation. First off, I cannot rank the new era, so that won't be included, but number six is seasons 21 through 26, AKA the Dark Ages. Number five is seasons one through eight, AKA the Old School Era. Number four is seasons 33 through 40, AKA the Big Moves Era. Number three is seasons 27 through 32, AKA the Renaissance Era. Number two is seasons nine through 14, AKA the Experimentation Era. And of course, number one is seasons 15 through 20, AKA the Golden Age. So what do you think about the different eras of Survivor? Would you split up the seasons differently? Let me know down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and doubly thanks for liking and subscribing. See you all next time.